Lord, to whom else shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. Amen. You have got to try this. You ever said that to somebody? Perhaps about some new food. Delicious soup or a tasty cheese. I said it to Rachel not that long ago about some new noodles that I had bought. I said, you've got to try this. These are some great noodles. Maybe about something old that you've done in a new way. Last Christmas, Rachel, I'm picking on you. I'm picking on you tonight, I guess. Rachel was making a dessert that required a graham cracker crust. And she was painstakingly breaking every graham cracker. And then the graham cracker bowl got hit to the ground and it all spilled on the floor. And that's when I came home. She was distraught because there was no more time. I said, wait, there's a better way. You've got to try this. Put the graham crackers in a bag and smack it against the wall a few times and you're good. Sometimes people say, you've got to try this about things that are much more serious. Someone that you love. You've got to try this new way to be on a diet or to quit smoking, whatever it is. We use it for a wide range of things, some rather trivial, some positively pivotal. And the more pivotal they are, the more important they are, the more insistent our urgings are likely to be. Never has anyone been more insistent, never anything more important than when Jesus spoke to his confused and sorrowful disciples all those years ago and said, do this. You've really got to try this. He was speaking, of course, about the Lord's Supper. And that's where we get the name for, for this day, Mondi Thursday. Mondano is the Latin word for commandment. It refers to two things that happened on this night. Jesus said to his disciples, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. And he said, do this. Do this in remembrance of me. You've really got to try this. And one of the reasons is how desperately you and I and they need it. And Jesus really meant it when he said, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. He's really specific about that, really urgent about that in the Greek. And one of the ways that he shows how urgent he is, is how he prepares it. It's kind of unique, isn't it? Well, except that he did almost the same thing a few days earlier on Palm Sunday. The way he sends Peter and John into the city. He tells them, go in there, you'll see this guy carrying a bucket of water. Follow that guy for a while. Go into the house, tell the master of the house. The teacher is asking, where's the room? And he'll show it to you. Clearly, Jesus had a place in mind. So why go to this specific lengths that he does. Why be so secretive about it? Why not tell all the disciples? Why not just tell them what the address of the place is or what it's next to? I think there's a couple of reasons. One of them is that he is showing them and us his power so that in a few hours when we see him allowing others to take him captive, and torture him, crucify him, we'll know that it was by choice. But there's something else here as well. Jesus knew that Judas was going to betray him. And he had every intention of allowing him to do so, but not quite yet. He wanted this quiet hour apart. He urgently desired to eat this Passover with his disciples before he was taken captive. And so he prepared a place safe from the devil's designs where he could have this meal with them. Because he knew how much they and you need it. And proof of this, for proof of this, we need probably look no further than the simple fact that we so often fail to desire the Lord's Supper the way that we should. And we never desire it the way that Jesus did. And think about that. Jesus didn't need it. It wasn't for him. It was for you. And yet he's the one who says, I have earnestly desired it. And no one ever desired it as much as Jesus did that night. You know, criminals on death row get one last meal. Anything they want. Or so I've read. But I doubt any of them ever said, I have earnestly desired to eat this steak before I die, because that meal is a portent of their doom. But Jesus, of this, his last meal, before his agony and suffering on the cross the next day, said, I earnestly desire to eat this Passover with you, his disciples, in order to give it to them and to the church and through the disciples to you. Because we desperately need it. You and I are great sinners. The thoughts and words and works which we do every day are a world of iniquity, a hellish inferno. Each one of them a terrible tragedy, each one of them bringing with it an eternal condemnation. And we really need no, look no further for the proof of this than the fact that we so often fail to realize how bad our sins are, so often fail to feel the weight and the guilt of them like we should. 
Think about it, Jesus, the sinless one, went to such lengths to prepare this meal for, for you and me, and yet how often do we fail to prepare or give much thought to this supper? Jesus earnestly desired to have this supper in order to be with the disciples, in order to be with you. And yet, do we earnestly desire to be with him? He earnestly desires to give. Do we earnestly desire to receive? He says, do this in remembrance of me. Do we? Or do we fail to recognize how great our need is? Do we get distracted thinking about what we ate earlier, still rumbling around in our stomach? Or about what so-and-so is wearing? Or about what we're going to do later? Or get annoyed because this is taking forever? Or get distracted by whatever? No one ever knew so well as Jesus how much you and I need this supper. For Jesus alone bore the full weight of the sins of the world. No one has ever known, like Jesus, how heavy sin really is. And he did that for you. He was the Father's true Passover lamb. He said to his disciples, I earnestly to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And it was for you that he suffered, for them that he suffered. Your sins, which caused him to be strung out on that cross the next day, nails pounded through his trembling hands, blood pulsing out of his pierced brow. No, no one has ever known the physical agony which Jesus knew, and yet that was nothing, nothing compared to the unseen agony, the suffering of his soul. For on that tree, he, true and holy God, incurably allergic to sin, entirely repulsed by it, was made to bear it all, was filled with it. For God made him who knew no sin to be sin in your place. So yes, Jesus knows exactly how great your need is. And that's why he says, I have earnestly desired to eat this supper with you, this, this Passover with you before I suffer. Because he knows how desperately you need it, and he knows that he has the only cure. Therefore, do this. You've really got to try it. You desperately need it. Please arise. Open your bulletin to page 5, and we'll continue with the Confession and Absolution. Hear my prayer, O Lord. In your faithfulness, answer me. In your righteousness. Enter not into judgment with your servant. For no one living is righteous before you. For the enemy has pursued my soul. He has crushed my life to the ground. He has made me sit in darkness like those long dead. Therefore my spirit faints within me. I stretch out my hands to you. My soul thirsts for you like a parched lamb. Answer me quickly, O Lord. My spirit fails. I not your faith from me. Must I be like those who go down to the death? Holy Father, righteous God, Satan has tricked and tormented us. His attacks are far stronger than anything we can bear. So often we have failed to see our need for you. So often we have denied you in pride and unholy living. So often we have been ashamed of you. Our sins crush us to the ground. Truly no one living is righteous before you. We are hopeless and helpless without you. Our spirits faint for you. We cry out to you. Be merciful to us and bless us, lest we be like those who go down to the pit. Deliver us, lest we die. Because of our great need, God sent forth our substitute, Jesus Christ. He is the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world to take away all your sins. When we ponder the overwhelming hopelessness and despair of our sin, we may turn our eyes to consider God's greatest work of all. Fix your eyes on Jesus Christ, in whose blood and by whose authority I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We join in the confession of our faith as printed in your bulletin. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. 
He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. What does this mean? I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord, who has redeemed me, a lost and condemned creature, purchased and won me from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death, in order that I may be his very own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, even as he is risen from the dead, lives and reigns to all eternity. This is most certainly true. Please be seated. We'll sing hymn 305, verses 1 and 4. desired to eat this Passover with his disciples and to give it to you. Not only because he knows how great your need is, but also because he knows what he fulfilled and what he therefore gives to you. What great treasures are yours here. See, for about 1,500 years, every year in the spring, the people of Israel had a very special day. On the 14th day of the month, Nisan, that was their first month of the year, every family would take a lamb, a male, without blemish, without spot, a year old, and they would kill it at highlight and they would paint the blood on their doorposts and they would boil it they would broil it with bitter herbs and eat it with unleavened bread and every year as they did this when the youngest among them would ask what is this all about what does this mean the fathers of each household would explain the bitter herbs are for our bitter servitude and suffering in Egypt the unleavened bread is for the haste with which the Lord God called us out this is the Lord's Passover by the blood of the lambs and by the blood of the firstborn sons of Egypt, he redeemed us. He brought us out and made us to be his own holy special people. So every year, 
we remember. Every year they did. And then one year, Jesus, the master of the house of Israel, sat down to eat the Passover with the family of his disciples, and he said, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And by saying that, he began to explain to them the real meaning of that 1,500-year-old meal. See, in the Greek, the word for Passover and the word for suffer are almost exactly the same. They come from the same root. One is Pascha, one, the other is Pasco. And that's not a coincidence. Jesus is teaching that it is his suffering, the suffering which he was about to go through on the cross the next day, which is the fulfillment of the Passover. For he is the Father's true Passover lamb, just as Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 5, Christ, our Passover lamb, was sacrificed for us. And as John the Baptist had foretold, well, he pointed to Jesus across the water and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This was what Jesus came for. The suffering the next day is what his entire life had been about. He was coming into his own, and that 1,500-year-old meal was finally finding its fulfillment in him. He was about to do what he had come do. And what he says and gives to the disciples this night proves it. He took bread and broke it and gave it to them and said, this is my body. He took a cup. He blessed it and he said, take and drink. This is my blood. And you might wonder, where's the lamb? Like those old commercials. Where's the beef? You know, if you sit down to dinner and there's no beef, what's going on? Where's the beef? Well, if you sit down at a Passover meal and there's no lamb, what's going on? Where's the lamb? Well, they did have it, undoubtedly. But the gospel writers make no or almost no mention of it. And that is noteworthy. I mean, the cup and the bread are a regular part of the meal, but the lamb is the centerpiece. Why would they not mention it? Because Luke, by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit through Luke is showing us that Jesus is the lamb. When Jesus gives them the bread and says, this is my body, and when he gives them the cup and says, this is my blood, he is giving them the lamb. For he is giving them himself. He, the fulfillment of the Passover of old. He, whose blood alone could cleanse them from every sin and defilement. His blood of the covenant. See, when God led the children of Israel out of Egypt all those years ago, he brought them to Mount Sinai. There, he made a covenant with them. He gave them the law. And after giving them the law, we read this from Exodus 24. So Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. As Moses had sprinkled the people with the blood of animals to seal one covenant, so Jesus gives his blood to seal another, to be another. For he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. But it's a covenant which is not in any way like the covenant which God gave through Moses. We read about that in our scripture reading from Jeremiah. Jeremiah spoke about the new covenant that God was going to give. In reality, it's a very old one. It's the covenant that he made as soon as Adam and Eve had fallen into sin. It's a covenant which Jeremiah defines as the forgiveness of sins. So when Jesus says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, he is saying, here, in my blood, the blood of the Passover lamb, here is the forgiveness of your sins. For Jesus is the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It is his blood which redeems you. His death which buys you back from sin and hell and Satan, his suffering which justifies you, by his stripes you are healed and in him you are forgiven. And this is what you receive in the sacrament. And Jesus is so specific about that. He says, not this bread is like my body, this cup is like a covenant, or this wine is like my blood. He says, this is. And as if that wasn't enough, as if it wasn't specific enough for Jesus to say that, he goes on and defines exactly what he means with one of the most wonderful little words in Greek. It's my favorite Greek preposition. It's a preposition who pair. And it's a substitutionary sacrificial preposition. That means, it means, in your place. What Jesus is saying is, this bread is the body which is being given in your place. And this cup, is the new covenant in my blood which is being poured out in your place. He is pointing them forward to the suffering that he will undergo in a few hours, just as he did earlier when he said, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. The body we receive when we eat this bread is the body which was strung out on that wooden tree. The blood 
which we receive when we drink this wine is the very blood which was soon to flow down in great rivers of mercy from his sacred wounds. This is why Jesus is so earnestly desiring to give the supper to his disciples and through them to you and to me. Because he not only knows how greatly you need it, what great sinners you and I are, but also knows what treasures are here. These are the very jewels of heaven. This is the true Passover lamb. Here is the bread of immortality. Here is the very royal wine of heaven. Yes, Jesus earnestly desired to give this to his disciples and through them to you and to me. Because here is the only thing greater than your sins. Here is the blood of Jesus Christ. Here you are forgiven. We'll sing him 305, verses 3, 6, and 7. precious treasure neither cost nor pain will measure but the priceless gifts of heaven he to us hath freely given though the were proffered not would buy the gifts here offered Christ's true body for the riven and his blood for the ones given and though it ponder, cannot fathom this great wonder, that Christ's body air remaineth, though it countless souls sustaineth, and that he is giving with the wine we are receiving these great mysteries unsounded are by God alone expounded Jesus Son of life, my splendor, Jesus, thou my friend most tender, Jesus, joy of my desiring, fount of life, my zeal inspiring. Have you ever done something with someone that you loved for the last time, or at least for the last time for a long time? A friend moving away to another part of the country, or a child going off to college. You spend one last day at the ballpark, or one last time at your favorite restaurant or sitting around the family table. Jesus, on this night, earnestly desired to eat this Passover with his disciples, not only because he knew their great need, and knew the great gifts that he was offering, but also because he knew that this was going to be the last time that he ate this meal with them. Well, sort of. It was going to be the last time for a while. Jesus said, 
as one of the reasons why he earnestly desired to eat with them. He said, for I will not eat of it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. By kingdom of God here, Jesus undoubtedly has a number of things in mind. Certainly, the kingdom of God was fulfilled the next day when he gave his life on the cross and said, it is finished, God's work to redeem. His kingdom was fulfilled three days after that when he broke free from the grave's shackles and brought the light of sun and righteousness and forgiveness to all who believe in him. And you might remember that that day in the evening, he did break bread and eat it with two disciples and Emmaus. But Jesus ultimately is really referring to the culmination of all of these things, to that banquet feast of heaven which goes on forever. And that feast is foreshadowed by this one. But actually, it's more than just foreshadowed by it. See, in the Lord's Supper, Jesus comes to us and spreads the feast of eternity here in earthly bread and wine. Here, he is the host and we the guest, and we are not alone. We talked about this in Bible study on Sunday. We read this quote from Hebrews 12. I'm going to read again. And the writer here is in, at least in part talking about the Lord's Supper. But you have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. When we gather to receive his body and blood, we are receiving a piece of the world to come, we are joining in the feast of all the company of heaven with angels and archangels, with believers in heaven and with believers on earth. Here we come to get away from all the sorrows, the guilt, the pains of earthly life and lean our weariness on him, lose our sorrows in his joy. You know, many people go to great and often idolatrous lengths to have a little time or try to have a little time with people that they have lost talking to those who have passed beyond this life. Every time, it is either a trick or it is devilry. And yet here, Jesus, your dearest friend, after dying and rising again, and because he has died and risen and risen again, comes to you and it is no trick. And it certainly is no devilry. Here he comes to have fellowship with you. Here you see him face to face. Here he feeds us, forgives us, strengthens us, and sustains us on our way. This feast, which we could never celebrate too often, is both partaking now of the feast yet to come and itself a means by which Christ brings you to that feast. This is why he so earnestly desired to give it to his disciples and so earnestly desires to give it to you. For here he gives you that alone which can cover your great need. Here he satisfies your wasting heart on that long road to eternal life. Here he gives you a piece of that which he will bring you to have in eternity. See, Jesus knew where he was going. And he knows where all those who believe in him will go one day. And so here in this supper, he gives you the bread of immortality. Here he gives you the wine of heaven. Here he says, do this. You have really got to try this. Because of what you need, because of what